right, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to everyone that will be watching online. The book of Joel is where we're going to be this evening. Joel or Joel? Joel. Joel. The minor prophet of Joel. Okay. Yes. All pages are stuck together. Yep, those are flyover pages usually. I think it was Mark that said minor prophets, what, about a yeah. year ago? I'm so we're, we're finally into the minor prophets. This is crooked here. I needed them. My pages are all stuck together. Get my camera straightened out here. Hopefully it's not. All right, well, let's open up in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father, for uh, this uh, beautiful day, this beautiful week that you've given us, Father. We're just so grateful, Lord, for all the blessings. Thank you, Father, uh, for the opportunity that we can gather together around your word and discuss and talk and learn and and we just thank you, Father, for uh, just the just the life and excitement that we sense here this evening on the campus uh, here with the kids and the youth and in here in the Bible study room. And also uh, for those that will be tuning in tonight, Father, or that will be watching this, we just pray that this will be a blessing to all those that will be watching in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the book of Joel, we're going into Joel because it coincides with Second Kings chapter 12. Remember last week we looked at King Joash. Do you remember anything unique about King Joash? He was seven years old. <laughs> that would be unique. Seven-year-old king. What's that? He met his demise. Yes, he did. Joash started off good uh, because he was like a little child, the faith of a little child. And he had the priest uh, Jehoiada. Jehoiada was his name. And it said that as long as... Jehoiada was living, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But then when Jehoiada died, it started to go downhill because Joash became influenced by the leaders of Judah. And, uh, hey, come on in. So he let the leaders of Judah lead him down uh, the wrong path. Uh, so, let me see where we're at. Joash would reign for 40 years. And so um, his primary accomplishment, we cannot forget, his primary accomplishment was what? Do you remember him? Not restored. The temple restored, yeah. He refurbished. Is that what you said? Not. Okay, well, he, he refurbished the temple. He led, he led, he led the charge to, refer, to refurbish the temple. So while Joash was living, a, the prophet Joel came onto the scene. And so that's why we're looking at Joel tonight. So we, we kind of have the context behind the book of Joel. By the way, the minor prophets, those books are not in chronological order. We'll go in chronological order and we'll bring in the prophets according to the king. All right. So the book of Joel. So Joel is written during the reign of King Joash. He is the second writing prophet. Do you remember what the first, who the first writing prophet was a couple weeks ago? Obadiah during King Jehoram. The theme of Obadiah was um, judgment to Edom, Israel's enemy. But the theme of Joel was the day of the Lord. It's judgment to Judah. It's judgment to Judah. The day of the Lord over and over. Now, we're not going to... I figure what we do is if we get to these minor prophets, we'll do like a bird's eye view of the books where we can just cover it just in one lecture. And you then you can uh, you can read it for yourself. So the day of the Lord, we see the day of the Lord over and over in the book of Joel as you read it, which we're not going to read the whole thing, okay? The day of the Lord, when you see that in the Bible, you see it a lot in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Uh, it has a twofold aspect. It has a judgment aspect. And a blessing aspect. So it's not just tied into one, one thing. It could be a blessing and a judgment. And we'll see both. We'll see the blessing aspect of the judgment of the Lord and the judgment aspect of the day of the Lord. All right. So Joel, he opens up in chapter 1 with judgment to Judah. He's, he's pronouncing judgment. <coughs> So to begin, Joel means Jehovah is God. The name Joel. And that's what's interesting, what I find interesting with these names is their names that kind of play into 
their purpose. Joel means Jehovah is God. God is Jehovah. His ministry started somewhere between 830 and 820 B.C. Joash became king in 835. So uh, Joel came onto the scene somewhere within a few years of Joash becoming king. Um, it was written to Judah under the reign of Joash. Now, since the first it's dealing with judgment since it starts off dealing with judgment. My guess is that it was written sometime after Jehoiada the priest died. <laughs> after they rebelled. So that's just my guess is he's coming on and he's writing this or, or getting this prophecy from the Lord after Joash rebelled. All right. Um, the nation was in decline. The country has reverted back to idolatry. Now, the prophets, what, is, what are the main reasons why God sent the prophets to the kings, to the nation? For correction. Primarily for correction, yeah, for correction and for warning. So they were sent to correct. To warn. It, a prophet wasn't just someone who foretold the future, although we see that in most of the books, but it's primarily to correct, to warn to turn them back, get back in line, turn back to the Lord. All right, so that's just some preliminary stuff. All right, chapter 1. Chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 11, is the pronouncement of judgment, if you, if you want to have an outline of how the book is, so how you can read it. So 1-1 one, one through 2-11 is the pronouncement of judgment. So let's read what the first judgment is that... We'll read verse 4, and this will be the, the first judgment. Verse 4 of chapter 1 of Joel. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. So the first judgment that God is going to send to Judah are the locusts. The judgment of the locusts. And you can read about the, lo the locust section is from verse 2 to verse 14. So you can, you can read that. Remember, Judah, led by King Joash, has turned away from the Lord. They've turned away from, I mean, they, they refurbished the temple. They brought the gold and they brought the, and all, the, all of that back to the temple. Remember, remember when they were refurbishing the temple? But then, towards the end... They gave it away for the bribe. Remember, they gave it away. So they're living, they're living the high life. They're, um, they're wealthy. They're prospering. They, they think, they hey, we don't need Jehovah God. And God shows them by sending locusts to devour the land, to destroy, to destroy the land. And uh, locusts, we've seen locust judgments throughout the Bible, haven't we? Remember the locusts in Egypt? We also studied locusts in a Revelation, didn't we? It's one of, one of the uh, judgments that will be coming during the tribulation. So, uh, <coughs> so locusts, look at verse 13. So Joel's not only addressing the people, but he also addressed the priests. Verse 13, gird yourself and lament, you priests. Well, you who minister before the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. So by understanding the context of the priests and how they've turned and how they're defiled, you can see the context now, can't you? Why Joel is writing to the priest as well. <laughs> They've turned away from the Lord. They're defiling the sacrifices and the offerings. All right. Uh, look at verse 15. So we have the judgment with the locusts. And then now from 15 to 17, we have the judgment of the drought, that God will send a drought on the land. Verse 15 says, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. It is, is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. 
And so he's sending drought upon the land. All right? So there's the judgments, the pronouncement of judgment. He's speaking to the king. He's speaking to the people. He's speaking to the, to the priests. You've defiled yourself. And so he's, he's getting their attention. Any, uh, any questions, observations, thoughts with the judgment aspect? Okay. Chapter 2 begins another form of judgment. So we've seen two judgments so far. From chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, is invasion of the Assyrians. So it's not just locusts. It's not just a drought. But he is pronouncing a judgment. Your enemy, the Assyrians, are coming to defeat you. Pastor Ray, how is this being told? So like the Lord has given this message to Joel, mm -hmm. and then he goes into the town square. He and would, he have, tells the he would have wrote it down... Uh, I don't know the, the, how he would present it, whether he would write it on the scroll and give it to the people to read or whether he would it deliver it himself. Like Psalms versus him going somewhere and saying the Lord spoke to me. and like it being He would have written it down. He would have written, he's known as a writing prophet. So that means this would have been written down and how it would have been delivered. I, I would probably say all of the above. The scroll was given to the king, the, the priests, I, it would have got to the people, put it that way. Okay. But yeah, you can see there's a lot of symbolism in it. Mm -hmm. And so, like for instance, it doesn't necessarily say the Syrians will come and invade you. It's, it's symbolism. Like if you read uh, chapter 2, verse 2. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Now, if you was just to read through it, you're like, what in the world does that mean? If you go down to verse 20, it speaks of the northern army. Well, the northern army, it's the Assyrians. So the great people that he's referring to is, is the Assyrian army is coming. So it's somewhat like Revelation or Daniel and some lots of symbolism. You have to you just have to study it out. But that's exactly who, who this is referring to. It's referring to the Assyrians. Now, regarding the Assyrians, we do understand that there are two kingdoms, right? The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom, the line of Judah. That's why they're called Judah, the line of, of David. The northern kingdom. They were all wicked kings, but they were still part of Israel. The, this is given to Judah. This prophecy is primarily given to Judah. But, but the Assyrians in 7, let's see when it is. In 721, the Assyrians would take down the northern kingdom once and for all. The Assyrians are not going to take down Judah. It's the Babylonians. You've heard about Babylonian exile. That's to Judah. That's not to the whole house of Israel. The Babel, like Nehemiah, we're talking about Nehemiah. That was, that's Judah, that's Jerusalem. So the Assyrians would defeat the northern kingdom in 721 and uh, wipe them out for good, <laughs> for good. And we'll actually get to that. But in 701, 20 years after that, the Assyrians would try to take out Judah just like they took out the northern kingdom. That's what this is referring to. This will come to pass. The Syrians are going to come, and they're going to ravage the land. They're going to destroy your territory. Of course, it's probably, we've all, they will have seen what they've done to the northern kingdom. So it's going, to, it's going to spread, it's going to cause them to fear. And so that is what this is referring to. The Assyrians are going to come. However, we will see that God will not allow the Assyrians to take out Judah. God will intervene on their behalf which we'll see in just a minute. So, anyways, just to keep in line, three judgments, locusts, drought, and here we can discern that the Syrian army is going to invade Judah. But what's so awesome about God is he never gives judgment and stops it right there. <laughs> He's always offering grace. He's always offering mercy. He's always offering 
the opportunity for his people to repent. So the second part of Joel is uh, the invitation for repentance. This is my outline, how I put it. I like working with outlines. It makes me, I'm a systematic. So if I was, so the first part, the pronouncement of judgment, the three, the, the three judgments, and then the second part, the invitation for repentance. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And this is a pretty much of a standard <laughs> how the prophets go. They pronounce judgment. They give an opportunity to repent. Or they're given the opportunity to repent. Uh, let's see, I'm going to read uh, verses th 13 and 14. Uh, God through the prophet is saying, So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. I mean, that's, I mean, he's, he's, think about that. He's, he's, he's saying judgment is coming, but then, but then he says, he's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's, he's kind. And I'm sure they're thinking, yeah, he's, yeah, you, you're real kind. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So this verse does show that, that God is not a mean ogre <laughs> wanting to judge his people. He's wanting to bless. Waiting for you to mess up, right? right. He says, I'm, wait, I'm waiting to relent. You know, the, the Old Testament God gets a bad rap of being the mean. He's the mean God. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, you know, the New Testament God, he becomes nice and gracious. But the reality is, he's the Lord, he changes not. He's the same yesterday. He's just as gracious in the Old Testament as he is in the New Testament. The, the pro, it's not God's fault. They could, have, they could have foregone this judgment if they would have repented, right? They brought it on themselves. It's like hell. Don't blame God. God never sent anyone to hell, <laughs> He's offered a way out. So it's kind of the same, the same parallel. Here's a way out. Judgment is coming unless you repent. And you won't have to go through the judgment. Same thing today. You can be saved and receive Jesus Christ, or you can choose hell. Don't blame God for, for hell, you know? So God, he gives this, this gracious opportunity in, in those verses 12 through 17, which are verses that are often used for revival. Revival verses, return to the Lord's. He's gracious, merciful, slow to anger. And that's section two. And we're going to actually finish the time in section three. That'll, that'll, be, the, that'll be a good discussion. Any thoughts so far? Yeah. Verse 13, uh, rend your heart and not your garments. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty important there. Mm. As garments being like, your outward appearance. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to act like on the outside. I want you to. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that that's a very yeah. good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, just <laughs> doing, just looking like you're supposed to, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. it's your heart. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, one of the customs of those days was to actually rip the garments, sackcloth, ashes. Woe is me. It's an outward sign of repentance. But God's like, whatever. Whatever. You can rub as much ash as you want on you. You know? Like they like of course we've got uh, we're in the time of Lent for Catholicism is Lent and the ashes. You can put as much ash as you want to on your face. But it's it's your heart. <laughs> it's your heart. It's it's not the outward. And that's a very good observation. It's the hidden man of the heart. So the judgment the opportunity to repent. And of course, those, we're not diminishing those outward signs because it is a good outward sign, but ultimately it is the heart. So now, uh, the third section is the pronouncement of blessing. Judgment, opportunity to repent, and the pronouncement of blessing from chapter 2, verse 18 to chapter 3, verse 21. And so under the pronouncement of Blessing, it starts with restoration. Of course, God is a God of restoration, and God is going to restore Israel. 
verses 18 through 32 of chapter 2, the restoration of Israel. So I'm going to read verse 20. I'll read several of these verses, and you'll see. Remember, the army's coming in. The locusts are going to devour the land. There's going to be a drought in the land. But God, in verse 20, chapter 2 says, But I will remove far from you the northern army. That's, that's where we know that that's referring to Seir. I'm going to, they're going to come in. But then he says, I will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Isaiah 37 actually uh, mentions when the Assyrians will come and, and the Lord will actually kill 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. That's in Isaiah 37. The king of Syria would be defeated. So the stench, all the death, that, that's what all of that is referring to. And so, yes, the army is coming. I'm going to allow them to come, but I'm also, I'm also going to defeat them. I'm also going to, going to destroy them. Look in verse 21. Here's another part of the... So, so now, so we've got the day of the Lord... The judgment aspect, when, it's, when you see day of the Lord, day of the Lord, the day of the Lord also has the blessing aspect. This is the blessing aspect. Verse 21, fear not, O land. Remember the locusts that have devoured the land, the drought upon the land? Now he's pronouncing a blessing upon the land. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. So the, the, the judgment, all of the, the fruit and all is going to be devoured, but this is the blessing. I will bring the fruit back. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For you, now you, these are, we're starting to enter into the territory. This is, these are popular verses here. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So the drought of judgment, I'm now going to cause the rain to return. But it's all in one. It's all in one scroll. Okay. There's like I don't know how to say all of this. With these minor prophets, and I think you'll see, you're going to see in just a second. I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago. You have near near far prophecies, where you have to see near. It's like there's near and far prophecies jumbled up together. <laughs> Remember, the prophets know in part, and they prophesy in part. So a lot of these prophecies, it's near in that this will be fulfilled within a few hundred years. And then it's far. The far prophecies are referring to the end times, tribulation, millennial. So now we're getting into the time to where you're going to start seeing, oh, this is end time. It's like end time stuff is jumbled in to near, near time prophecies, if that makes sense. I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> um. Isaiah, near, far, simultaneously. Uh, let me just continue reading, and you'll see what we're talking about. So, then it says, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. So God sends the locust, the drought, but he would bring restoration, and the land would once again become fruitful. This is near far. It's near in that aspects of this restoration to the land have been fulfilled. For instance, even modern day Israel. Back, if you remember when Victor Stursky was here and he showed a picture of what the land looked like back during the Holocaust time and all, it was just barren. Well, it's fruitful now. It's, it's lush. So it's partially fulfilled but it's not completely fulfilled because it won't be completely fulfilled until the millennial kingdom. So 
Another thing, always understand when you see these future, it's usually referring, the judgment is referring to the tribulation and the blessing is referring to the millennial kingdom. So there, so we're getting into that. So this is kind of a partial, partial fulfillment, but yet we're still, the land is not completely restored yet, obviously, right? Um, look at verse 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. Well, we can't say that this is completely fulfilled. It's partially fulfilled because it says you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. There's still people in Israel that are not eating and being satisfied, are they? So you can see a lot of this is referring to the millennial kingdom. Uh, it says, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Well, are his people being put to shame still? Is there anti-Semitism going on? <laughs> so partial fulfillment, but this is still, you still keep, he's keeping that millennial kingdom because ultimately that's when Israel will be restored. It's the coming kingdom of Christ. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Right now they don't know that Jesus is in the midst of Israel, do they? But during the millennial reign, they'll know that Jesus is in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. So when you, when you read, you can read through the lens of, yes, there are short-term historical prophecies that have already been fulfilled, like this in... Uh, uh, some people say that this was partially fulfilled with Hezekiah. Uh, when God prospered the land, I don't know for sure. But ultimately, whenever you see verses like this that are just like, my people shall never be put to shame, it's ultimately going to the future kingdom. Because that all of history is moving towards the kingdom, right? It's all moving towards the kingdom. Okay, now uh, verse 28. Now you're going to, you'll recognize these verses. As good Pentecostals. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> but I'm going to show you something tonight that, that you, this, is, this is often taken out of context. By good Pentecostals. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Do you know what New Testament apostle quoted these verses? Peter. Peter. You know when he quoted these verses? At Pentecost. Pentecost, right. Remember when they thought he was their drunk? <laughs> and he... He said, this is what was foretold of the prophet Joel, and he quoted it. Here's, here's what I want to show you this evening. We've got to be careful with these verses. We've got to be careful because these verses are often taken out of context, meaning that we look at what Peter said, and we say, oh, this was fulfilled at Pentecost. This was... You know, remember what I've told you about context, context. You've got to keep the verse in context. That's why a lot of uber charismatics they pull these old testament scriptures and they isolate them from the original context and they create whole doctrines out of them and say oh that your your daughters are going to start prophesying your old men's going to start dreaming dreams your young men are going to see visions your and also on your men servants and may i will pour out my spirit now yes it is referring to the time of the outpouring of the spirit but it's not entirely referring to the time of the outpouring of the Spirit, because look, you look at um, look at verse thirty, and I'm gonna show I'm gonna show you that this wasn't entirely that it's not entirely speaking of Pentecost. Revelation. Yeah. Revelation. Yeah. What's it say in verse thirty? Yeah. And I will show you show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and the pillar of smoke. So you're getting it. Well, yeah, the sun shall be turned into dark. When will the sun be turned into darkness? Revelation. What period of time? Tribulation. Tribulation. Yeah. This is contextually, 
This is during the tribulation period. We'll keep on, we'll keep on reading. It says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So we, we know that during the tribulation, we know the judgments. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. We've already studied the, the, the trumpet judgments, the seal judgments. Smoke, blood, all of that. So this is ultimately pointing to the judgment aspect of the day of the Lord. So let me just make sure that, we, that, I'm, that, that you understand what I'm saying. Yes, it is true that the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. Obviously, Peter was correct in quoting Joel here. But we also need to keep in mind that at that time, it was the, it was the birthday of the church. It was the initial birth of the church. Peter was still progressing in his knowledge of Scripture and in his knowledge of prophetic future events. Because if you read later in Acts, and you even read in 1st, 2nd, Peter, you'll see his progression. So he was partially, partially correct, but not entire. It, it wasn't in complete fulfillment. Because in the context, if we read all the way around this, we're talking about the tribulation. During the tribulation, remember the tribulation, remember this was written to, to Judah. During the tribulation, Remember the, the Jewish evangelists? Remember the Jews that are going to be out witnessing? So in the context, it's referring to God pouring his spirit upon those evangelists, the, pro the prophecy during the time of the tribulation. Because, because then it says, look at, verse, uh, uh, look at verse 32. It says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So think about what we know about our study of Revelation. The Jewish evangelists are sent out. The Spirit of God is upon them, witnessing God offering grace to all those who would call upon his name. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, there's going to be people saved during the tribulation. So this is, this is referring to the tribulational time. Because it says, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. The deliverance is going to be in Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. That's where Jesus is going to return to at the end of the tribulation. Mount Zion, Jerusalem, that's where his temple is going to be set up. Does that, does that make sense? Isn't it interesting when you're just, when you're just a Bible student and you just, <laughs> and you just read in context? Now, of course, we still obviously believe in the power that the, that the Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. Obviously, we believe in that. But in the context of the Scripture, it's referring partially to Pentecost, but more precisely to the Tribulation. How, do, how else do we know that it's part of, that it's referring to the tribulation? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days... Now, now remember, we're under the blessing, the pronouncement of blessing. This is a pronouncement of blessing that during the tribulation, God is going to save his people. Those who call upon his name, God will save them during the tribulation. Chapter 3, 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem... I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I don't know exactly what the valley of Jehoshaphat is. It's, people can only guess what it is, the reality is. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel. Whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. Okay. What do you think this is referring to? I'll just give you some clues. Is there going to be a time at the end of the tribulation when all the nations are going to gather? Armageddon. Yeah. That's what most scholars believe, that this is referring to Armageddon. So now, all of the Gentile, see Assyria, Gentile nation, 
that God allowed. So God is judging these Gentile nations that are coming against his people. So this is a pronouncement of blessing. This is the blessing aspect is, yes, Judah, you're going to have to, you're going to face judgment. But in the end, I will rescue you. I will deliver you. He's going to gather all the nations. Once for all, all of the nations are going to be gathered. And, of course, we know that when all the nations are gathered together, they've surrounded, uh, they've surrounded Israel. Jesus is going to return. That's the second coming of Christ. When Jesus returns, speaks the word, and destroys all of the nations. Skip to verse 16 of chapter 3. The Lord also will roar from Zion. Remember when Jesus returns, he's returning to Mount Zion. Well, he's returning to the Mount of Olives. <laughs> but he's, Mount Zion is where the temple, the millennial temple will be set up. Roaring from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heaven and earth will shake. But the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And most all of that is pointing to the end of the tribulation to Armageddon. So let me finish up. Skip down to verse 18. And it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine. The hills shall flow with milk. And all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness. Remember the Edomites. Those were the descendants of Esau, the enemy of Israel. Because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land, but Judah shall abide forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I had not acquitted for the Lord dwells in Zion. So what do you think those scriptures are referring to in prophecy? What comes after the tribulation? The second coming of Christ, the millennial reign. That's the kingdom reign, yep. So remember on, on God's timetable, which by the way, people say we, we, we don't know, we don't know when the, Lord, we don't, when the Lord's coming back, well, we don't know the time he's coming back, but we knew, according to Scripture, we know the structure. We know the structure. We know that the rapture of the church, that's next, on, that's next on the timeline. That's when the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. Then the seven years of tribulation. Then after the seven years of tribulation, we come back with Jesus, and that's the second, second coming or the second advent. The rapture of the church, he doesn't come back to earth. He's in the clouds. We go up. But this, this time frame here is when Jesus comes back to earth and touches down and we come back with him. And then he enters in the millennial kingdom, which during the kingdom, that's the time that Israel shall be saved and he will rule. He will rule as king of kings from Mount Zion. So yes, that is the millennial reign. So let's just review all of this. Context, Joash is king, they've declined. Joe comes onto the scene, pronounces judgment, a near and a far judgment. The near judgment, the locusts and the armies, the far judgment, the tribulation. <laughs> but then he gives them an opportunity to repent, and he also uh, speaks of the future blessings of Israel, the blessing of the Lord that his second coming is going to defeat all the enemies of Israel once and for all and usher in the millennial kingdom. So that's the book of Job in a nutshell, and you can read it for yourself. This, the, the outpouring, a little side note, something to remember going forward, the outpouring of I will pour out my spirit upon flesh in the context. Yes, there is, there's a Pentecost, of course, is there. But the primary function in the context is the Spirit being poured out upon the witnesses to reach, to give an opportunity of grace for those in the tribulation period. So um, with that being said, any, any observations, questions, comments?
you know, when you read these, um, another scripture that is often misinterpreted is the scripture uh, which says, Rejoice, uh, fear not all land, rejoice, be glad. Be glad then you children, for he has given you the former rain. He will cause... Okay, so I will restore. 225, I think is it. When it says, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. I've also heard some of the prosperity preachers pull these scriptures out, and they'll go to some form of money. The locust of... They've eaten your finances, your money. But I decree and declare to you that what the locust has, has eaten, God's going to restore your land. And your land, you're going to be prosperous. And they, they just automatically turn this into a spiritual thing like God's about to pour out a, a prosperous blessing on you. And the locusts are no more, the, the locusts aren't going to eat, they're not going to eat your stuff up anymore. <laughs> You're going to have money in the bank. You're, you're going to be able to pay your bills. God's going to prosper you. Oh, your land is blessed. But that's not accurate. <laughs> that has nothing to do with God financially blessing you or the locusts eating up your finances. It's referring to the millennial, <laughs> the millennial kingdom. So you see what I'm saying, how it's so easy to pull these verses out and twist them. And, and they make you, they sound good. It doesn't mean it's accurate. This is 100%, this is referring to Israel's future blessing. This has nothing to do with us being blessed financially. <laughs> it's showing that God is a covenant-keeping, faithful God who even though his people have failed him, in the end, I love you enough that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch over you. I'm going to take care of you. This is my plan for you, says the Lord. The, the Jeremiah 29, 11, we take, that's another verse. God's got, a good, God's got a good plan for you. It's a plan to prosper you and not harm you. And we quote, we got all that scripture. God's got a good plan to prosper you. The reality is that has nothing to do with a present prosper prosperity, you know, prosper and a blessing. That's referring, that's referring to the millennial kingdom. In the end, <laughs> God's got a good plan for you. See that? So uh, that's why I think going through these are very important because it's one thing to, it's one thing to have verses and we have our verse of our life verse and we can think whatever we want to think, but it doesn't mean it's correct. <laughs> So, I do have a yes. No one had asked this, but when they, they received this prophecy, they didn't know when it was going to happen. But they told the uh, priest or whomever. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? They didn't know, but they knew God said it was going to happen someday. Because He's talking about the Lord, mm -hmm. and I think of Jesus as the Lord. Yeah, but it's messianic. It's absolutely messianic. So they probably didn't know when it was going to happen. They just used it. Yeah, they had no clue. <laughs> yep. And what's interesting is, as we go through some of the other prophets, they would speak of, like, the righteous branch, Zechariah, uh, which refers to Jesus. They would speak of the Messiah, and, and even the prophets did not know fully the Messiah because they're only prophesying in part. They didn't even, they didn't even have realization of Jesus the Messiah. So they were, everything was cloudy. Everything was cloudy. <laughs> so it doesn't, it all comes into realization when Jesus is born and ultimately in the second coming, the second advent, when Jesus returns, that's when Israel will recognize, finally recognize who Jesus is. Isn't it interesting when you have this type of perspective that really this was all, it was written to Israel. We just, we're, I don't want to say lucky, we're blessed to be able to just be part of it. <laughs> Joel wasn't written to the Christian. Joel was written to, to the Jews. We're just blessed because we get to play part, we get to be a part of this, and we get to enter into the millennial kingdom one day. <laughs> you know? So. All right, well, let's close in prayer. 
Lord, we thank you, Father, for the blessing, Father, that you have given to your people. And as a part of that blessing, we can, we can receive Jesus, the promised Messiah, and we can be grafted into the children of God, to the people of God, and we have the blessing upon us as well. So we thank you for the encouragement that we receive that, that yes, though you discipline, though you, you discipline and though you judge, it's always out of love. It's always out of kindness and always out of mercy, just like a father that has to discipline his kids. You do it, Father, because you, you want us to walk in your ways. You want us to, to walk according to your word. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you love us and you care for us more than we even care for ourselves. Lord, help us to be future-minded. Help us to be mindful of eternity and not to get so focused on the things of this world. We want to be focused on the eternal kingdom, eternal e e eternity with Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that we'd keep these words in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you all for tuning in. Y'all have a good, good week.